I just want to say that I appreciate Sister Dietrich sharing that um, about Owen. That's why we're there. What a great testimony. Yeah. And then um, I didn't realize you folks were friends. I've got to know Carol very well for my job. The first and, time um, first time we met him. He showed my husband the ball and he raised turkeys. Yes. And if you remember correctly, I you I think we're living like this at the He gave us, I don't remember if it was a 25 or a 30 pound turkey. It would not fit in my oven. <laughs> So Bob went down to Don's food room and asked Don if he would roast it for us. And he agreed. But he not only roasted it for us, he made gravy for us mm. out of it. And I, I don't think he would charge us $10. Oh, wow. Yes. And that was it. I'm telling you what, that turkey was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So to hear of that family, they're a very strong family of faith. His yes. brother just lost his daughter with a very courageous, uh, long journey of, of uh, brain cancer. And uh, if you knew Monica, she was a very smart girl. She was going to school to be, I think, a pharmacist and uh, developed a brain tumor and changed her life. But she still remained very sharp. And one thing about Monica that was testified about her that uh, Owen's wife, Carol, shared with me, she said, you know, one thing about her Bible, she said it was it was war. It was war hard. Though she was blind in one eye, she was able, never able to finish college, never able to live a life that she dreamed of. She still loved and trusted God unconditionally. Amen. I want to tell you, there's something about living for God that's true. Amen. You know, I, I, I said on Sunday night, we're either going to go by way of rapture or by way of the grave. It's inevitable, um, but it's the life that we live. When I think about Sister Layman tonight, just the confidence of how she lived her life, and even in death, what a blessing she was. Yes. Amen. Let's live life intentional. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I just appreciate the Lord. All right, so let's let's look some more at, at um, Revelation. We're going to look at 15. Finish up. Well, let's look at 15 quick. Refresh your memory. Jump into 16. Remember 15. Chapter 15 is the shortest chapter of Revelation. Could really be combined with chapter number 17 because we're looking at the seven judgment vows or bowls. Um, sorry, my hillbilly does not allow me to say either of those words very well. Uh, but uh, that's what we're looking at there. Uh, we were looking at the Word of God says, uh, John 7, verse chapter. Uh, chapter 15, verse 2, that he saw a sea glass mingled with fire. Amen. Uh, and those who had gotten victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. Amen. These are those who were murdered by the Antichrist. Um, those who did not accept Mark. Those who the Antichrist hated. Uh, and uh, uh, they, their prayer was for vengeance. And we're going to see that vengeance is given. Uh, God does answer prayer, doesn't He? <laughs> you know, how are these, what are these saints thinking at the time? How are they praying? I like to kind of put myself in Rome on that. You know, maybe they're looking for Justin for deliverance at the moment or vengeance right then. Uh, but, but God says, in my time and in my way, though their life, Mother Doug, is given, God does give vengeance. God answers prayer. And know that He does that. Amen. And uh, on his time. Amen. And uh, the Bible says that they stand uh, on the golden seat having the harps of God. They're singing that, that. It's just a real picture of peace and tranquility. It's a picture of what worship is with music there. And the Bible says that they sung uh, the song of Moses, making reference there back to, to uh, Deuteronomy 32, where Moses is singing of the deliverance of God. God delivers, doesn't he? Amen. God delivers. But not only the song of Moses, but the Bible says, uh, and the song of the Lamb. 
They also sung a song of God, deliverance, as Moses sang, but they sung a song of the Lamb. And, and what is that referencing? That they knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen. What a song that, that the saints of God, you know, we sing it on this side of heaven, but how wonderful it's going to be over there to sing of God's deliverance and be able to sing of the blood of the Lamb and the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary and how that has changed our life. Amen. And given us a wonderful eternity. Amen. The Bible says, Great and marvelous are, 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 are your works, the Lord God Almighty, your ways, uh, the King of the saints. We're going to look at the saints here in a bit. Amen. And, and look at that. Uh, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Amen. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple, the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Amen. We are talking about the temple. We're looking particularly at the Holy of Holies, uh, that place where, where, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the Shekinah glory of God was, where the mercy seat was. And the Bible says, and seven angels came out of that temple, having seven plagues, uh, constitutes uh, the, the, the vows that are there. And once again, uh, well, I won't, I won't go that far ahead. Uh, when we're looking at this, when we look at that word plagues, amen, we're not looking at like an epidemic. We are looking at a fatal punch or blow. Uh, God is about to pour out, pour out His judgment, not as an epidemic. Don't think of epidemics or pandemics, but think of it as the judgment of God. God saying, this is it. It's full. And, and now it's being poured out. And it's interesting as I studied some more on this in the past week that as the seven angels came out of the temple, the seven uh, plagues, they were, they were uh, pure, uh, clothed in pure and white linen. Amen. There's a couple things I want to say here. Why, why, the, let me just not get ahead of myself. Pure and white linen. When they come, they're robed in white, but as they are executing judgment, they're executing the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ. These judgments are the righteousness of God. Amen. God says, my, my wrath, my anger is full. Uh, we're looking more specifically right now at the, 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 those, the Antichrist. He is set up in Jerusalem. We're looking at this particular area. We're looking at those who have persecuted these uh, tribulation saints and they have died. And so clothed in righteousness, uh, uh, they're coming to exercise the righteousness of Christ and the judgment. And having on the, uh, having uh, uh, their breasts girded with golden girdles, amen, uh, pertaining to the work of Christ again. And one of the four beasts uh, gave unto the seven uh, angels seven golden vows full of the wrath of God, amen, who lives forever, amen. This is the worst of all the judgments that we see. These vows are full of God's wrath or God's anger, amen, and, and who lives forever and ever. God is eternal. Amen. And God's going to prove I am the eternal, almighty, self-existing God, and I'm pouring out my judgment. Now, only interesting here, though we read this last week, uh, the Bible says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from, uh, and from His power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now, listen. But this is not the first time that, that God's glory has filled the house with smoke. And when we look at the Old Testament, we find it referenced. But, but it's interesting, and I never thought about it. I, I may have thought about it, but never really found an answer until this past week. Why would no one be allowed to go into and out of the temple? Well, because uh, one man referenced, and I thought it was so good as I read it. It may have been a Frank Boyd. Uh, I'm not sure now. Uh, but one of, one of the commentators that I read uh, referenced that the reason why is because prayer would take place in the temple and that there would be the mercy seat where God's mercy would be poured out. God is not giving mercy in these judgments. And there's not going to be any prayers of anybody who's going to save these judgments. God is pouring it out. So with that thought said, let me say something to you. You're unsaved, loved ones? Pray for them. Yes. Because God's mercy is upon them. 
through the prayers of the saints. Amen. Mm. Amen. Praise God. Amen. On this side of heaven, we have access to the presence of God. We have access to the throne room of God. And when we pray, I believe with all my heart, we can see the mercies of God poured out. Amen. We need to do it. God's mercy will not be poured out here. And so the Bible says that no man was able... Uh, well, let's just go on to chapter number 16. Someone read 16, 1 and 2. I'll divide it up then uh, during uh, looking at the vibes. So someone read uh, verse 1 and 2. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying, To the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. All right, so the seven vials are getting ready to be poured out. We said these are the worst of all of God's judgment now. And as it begins, the Word of God says that there was a great voice out of the temple saying, Go your way and pour out those vows of wrath upon the earth. And in particular, uh, the Bible says, And went first and poured it out upon the earth, and there fell noisome or terrible destructive, painful, incurable, amen, grievous sores upon men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. So here are these painful uh, sores that are on the body, uh, ulcerated and flame. We said last week uh, that they were like the boils that was poured out in the plagues in Egypt. Also looking at Lazarus who was at the rich man's gate who was full of sores. But the idea of this, amen, that, 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 that these boils, they, uh, they're, they're inflamed and irritated and uh, they're, they're red. And, and Brother Craig, they're oozing and they're pussy and Brother Justin, they're, they're smelling terrible because of the bacteria that is in there. If you've ever smelled wounds that are full of uh, uh, bacteria, uh, uh, streptococcal bacteria, uh, they smell disgusting. And so that is the, the idea that is given here. Amen. And so here it is. It is poured out. Amen. Upon these people. So let's go ahead and read the second vow judgment. So the first one is, is the source. What's the second one? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Verse number three, if you would. And the second angel poured out the vow. So the second vow is being poured out, particularly in this area around Jerusalem, thinking more so most commentators fill the Mediterranean Sea here. The Bible says it became as the blood of dead men. So not to be grotesque, but what happens when someone dies? Their blood. It's not being oxygenated. It's not being, uh, you know, everything that happens in the liver and throughout the body, the lungs and the heart. It's not happening. So what happens to blood? turns black, it's coagulated, it's gel. Okay, so that's what the sea is like. Water is very important, folks. Whether you're whatever type of drinker you may be, on a good side, right? I meant like soda, coffee, yada, yada, yada. It's still the basis of all that is water. You may say, I'm not a water drinker. Well, you need fluids to survive. If you want to caffeinate them or sugar leak them or however you want to do them, it's still water. We need it. And so here it is, the aqua life. And so vegetation is affected. Uh, plant life is affected. So imagine all that being affected. We're going to say something stupid. It's saying here every living soul dies in the sea. Fish, soul, water, and then the soul is Fish, they would have to die because here's this block coagulated. You know, they're not getting the oxygen that they need. And if there's people in the, at sea for whatever reason, boating, uh, you know, cargo, however, they die. That's the effects of this. You know, imagine even if you're sailing a vessel. You're not sailing a vessel on this. The ship would die. Exactly. So it's interesting to think because we, we have to take into consideration that um, 
where the, the blood of dead men. You know, when you really think about what that is um, and how that would be in your righteous redemption, every living soul. Now, when I read this, and I want to take away from the Word of God, uh, commentators have said that where this is ever living, every living soul, a lot of commentators feel like it should have been translated every living creature. So if that helps out answering that. Um, uh, it's interesting. So, uh, you know, every person who's on ships will die along with every fish and every bit of aqua life. Okay, so I want to read the third vow, and that is verse number four through verse number seven. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and the earth was filled with Check on it, has it sold. 
And uh, we heard through someone who knew the lady that was selling the house, they couldn't wait to tell us the house sold. And somehow they bought this kit, and it's of one of the saints, and you bury it upside down in your yard. And within a week or two, her house sold. Interesting. I'm not sure that whole kit that she wasted her money on, you know, really did her any good. She probably should have just invested it in something different. Uh, I know it didn't do any good, but the Catholic Church has a way of making saints. And uh, I worked with a Catholic individual and they lost something. And they said, we pray to saints. And I can't remember who it is now because I don't really, I don't really care that much. But there's a saint. If you lose something, they pray to that saint. And uh, they help you. So they have all kinds of saints. But what is the making of a saint? Well, let's look at what is a saint. This is what God says. Listen, brother and sister, we should be saints. I don't look and say Saint Sharon or Saint Eli or Saint Justin. But when God looks at us, He sees us as saints because He has washed us in His blood and in our pure. Let's turn to, to uh, Galatians chapter number 6. And this kind of outlines what is a saint. So how can we be a saint? We're looking at saints. God has heard the prayer. God has avenged the prayer. So what is a saint? I'm going to be calling you to read different verses uh, in, in Galatians 6. But it kind of gives us an outline of what a saint is. Uh, in a nutshell. Now there are other things. But I think as we look at this chapter, uh, it is a good reference point. I did not come up with this. I found someone else who came up with that. But as I was looking, I thought, man, that's good. So what is a saint? So I want to read Galatians 6 1. Amen. So the very first thing of what a saint is, a saint is a brother or a sister. But but for just a, a common term, let's just use their brothers. Brother, uh, as saints, we are brothers. Brother Craig, as saints, we are brothers. So as we look at that, there is that responsibility that we have to one another. Now, now listen to me. There's something that, that really I look back in my years as a Christian, and even in my, my growth, and something that I would hope would be more instilled in me than I've seen in my past, or even seen executed in the church, and that is compassion. We need to have compassion. The Bible says that if we see a brother overtaken, uh, if we see a brother fall, that's our responsibility to restore them with hope and with love. And so as brethren, we should be willing to repair, to equip, amen, to bring back the effectiveness uh, 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 of, of the church and, and, and brotherhood once again. Amen. The emphasis is on curing and not punishing. So as a saint of God, what are we doing to cure one another? Not putting up walls of boundary, but what, what do we do as, as brothers and sisters to restore one another and to help one another? I think that's the first mark of sainthood as we see here. Brethren, if a man be overtaken with a father, you which are spiritual, restore him in the spirit of meekness. Because, you know, considering thou thyself, lest thou be tempted. Every one of us is going to be tempted on the Sunday. Sister Stacy, you're not alone in what you said tonight. Every one of us is with you. And, and you know what? I'll let you know I'm on your ship. No one else, everyone else may look pious, but I, I'm okay to say I am there too. Amen. And if we restore and we help one another, it's a good place to be. It's a real good place to be. Because when you're not that place, you're put yourself in the place of temptation and harm to it. All right. So I want to read verse number two. So you're a brother. What's the next thing that a saint would do? Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Wow. So a brother, but also a bearer. Amen. As a real saint, we need to bear one another's burdens. How do we do that? You know, it's easy to live in silos in our life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Man, I live in Lawton. Sister Stacy's up and like the sister, she's in the way up in Williamstown. And Brother Craig, man, he's over in no man's land. 
And Brother Doug, he's trying to hide out in some mountain 20 minutes away from me. You know, so we, we can sometimes feel like we're in silos, right? Yeah. Amen. You ever felt like that as a, as a believer? Amen. That you're kind of in your own silo? Amen. Uh, but, but God doesn't want us living like that. It's about breaking down the silos and bearing one another's first. Hey, I'm here for you. What can I help you? Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's being an encourager. Amen. It's, it's helping bear, bear a, love, uh, a heavy load that, that can be crushing to someone else. Amen. That's what I'm saying of God. So it's being a brother, but it's being a bearer. So I want to read verse number 4 of Galatians 6. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall we have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. Amen. So, so we're a brother, we're a bearer, but we're a builder. How do we build ourselves? Let me tell you, and I've said this before, we will never build ourselves in the faith by comparing ourselves to one another. No. Right. But, but I'm always going to fail you. And, you know, I can look at someone who's new in the faith and maybe doesn't have uh, 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 the teaching, the training, uh, uh, the, 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 the support that I've had in my life. Really, Sister Dietrich. I mean, I've lived this all my life, Brother Doug. So for me to compare myself to someone, of a, that's not my comparison. But if we're going to be a saint of God, amen, our comparison is not to be, oh, to be like Brother Daniel. Brother Daniel has lots of good qualities. And I want to be happy like him and smile and have that amazing smile, you know. But my qualities should be compared to Christ. The real builder of a saint is building our life like Christ. And so being a brother, being a bearer, being a builder, the standard of God's work, amen. Uh, uh, if we compare ourselves to others, we weaken ourselves spiritually. But when we compare ourselves to the Word of God, we strengthen ourselves spiritually. That is a real sight. So I want to read verse number 6. Amen. So he's a bestower. Amen. He is a good communicator of the truth of God's Word. Let me say this. I'm going to say this with liberty tonight. Uh, you know... When, when we as saints are trying to help others, and you know, there's some, really, Justin, there's some folks in my life who I really consider real saints because they've really helped me. Can you guys relate to that? That, you know, folks who have been a real pillar to you, people have been a real encouragement, they're a real saint of God. They've really helped me. If there's one thing that you'll notice about them, they have probably been a very good communicator of God's Word to you. You know, without going on rabbit trails, without saying this is what I think, or let's. But but look, what does God's word say on this? A real saint of God is a bestower because he gives the word of God to others. This is what I've learned of God. Let me teach you. That's a saint. So a brother, a bearer, a builder, a bestower. So I want to read verse number nine. Let us not be weary of our duty, for a new season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen. So he's a benefactor. So he's sowing seeds. And as he's doing so for the kingdom of God, he gets not weary because he really wants to get to harvest season. Now, Brother Doug, I planted a pen of a zucchini. I planted in a really dumb place. But I tried to go where like it would be in the way of the crack. And Brother Doug, I wasn't a very good water. Guess how many zucchinis I got off of that? Still living. I just don't know what the deal is, but you know, I really wasn't a good, a good farmer of that zucchini. But I did plant some tomatoes. Now, uh, went down here below the here I was selling for just a little bit of nothing. Got four different brands of tomatoes. I enjoyed four different brands. But I have taken care of them. I find them in a good location. Or or better, you know, it's not like I'm some great big farmer. But but I look forward to harvesting. And so with buying some tomatoes and mixing with what we got, my wife and I make tomato soup. And you know, Brenda, she loves the little cherry tomatoes. So she's like a little rabbit uh, on the way home. But I guess the thing that I'm saying is this. I planted and I did I was diligent in watering and taking care of them so I can harvest. 
You see, as believers, we have to be diligent in what we do and not grow weary. Because the benefactor of that is this, is that when we reap a harvest, most often it isn't for us alone, but it blesses others as well. So our real saying of God says, I'm not going to get weary of well doing. I don't care what others do. And I know that it's difficult going through uh, areas of, of life, um, but through the fire I'm going to trust God. And when we're not weary of well doing, that is a real mark of a saint of God. Because many people reap the benefits of it.